now uh, this is uh, an introduction to the head and neck uh, region and the neuroanatomy part of what we are going to do during the next few weeks uh, now uh, you have already uh, had a practical by uh, dr himani uh, on the osteology of the head and neck region uh, she said she did mainly the skull uh not the cervical vertebral column so we will be touching upon the cervical vertebral column as well uh, to start with uh, the bones of the skull uh, there are several bones forming the skull and uh, they are united at fibrous joints uh, found at the sutures you know there are different sutures like the sagittal suture coronal suture lambdoid suture um, and and so on and uh, the bones uh, can be uh, considered in two groups bones that form the skull can be considered in two two groups cranial uh, bones the bones that form the cranium and the bones that form the uh, the, the face cranial bones and uh, facial bones some of these bones are paired some others are single uh, and many of the most of these bones are formed by membranous ossification now when we when you study the long bones of the body you learn that they undergo endochondral uh, ossification but here uh, the the skull bones are formed most of them are formed by membranous ossification so this is how you um, list the bones um, the cranial bones uh, you have a frontal bone here then you have two parietal bones left and right then you have uh, one occipital bone then two temporal bones left side and right side then there is one sphenoid bone you can see the sphenoid here okay there is one sphenoid bone you can only see a small part of the sphenoid bone on either side to see it clearly either you have to uh, look uh, inside the the cranium or you have to look Uh, at an inferior view of the uh, skull then the ethmoid bone again to see that you have to uh, have an in internal interior view so you see the sphenoid the, the, there are two wings there is a greater wing and a lesser wing of sphenoid uh, then you have the ethmoid bone here so these are even though this is large it is taken as a single uh, bone in yellow color so you can see the other bones also in this view you see the frontal bone here occipital bone the two parietal bones on either side and the uh, the two temporal uh, bones with its different parts like petrous part and the squamous uh, part you have learned all these things by now i think then when it comes to the uh, the bones contributing to form the facial skeleton you have two zygomatic bones on either side then you have two maxillae on either side this is zygomatic two maxillae on either side then you have two nasal bones then two lacrimal bones it's not shown here lacrimal bone is somewhere here i show you okay so this is lacrimal bone in green color here then there is a bone called vomer which is attached to the hard palate and uh, the, the two palatine bones you have one here and another one there it's not very clear in this view if you look at the look inside here you will uh, if you open the mouth and see you will see the hard palate in two halves <clears throat> then uh, this inferior uh, concha inferior concha two inferior concha this is uh, this contributes to form the lateral wall of the nasal cavity you will learn that when you do the paranasal sinuses and the nasal cavity now you can see one here another one there uh, and there is this middle concha also but they are not separate bones they are part of the ethmoid bone that is this one okay so the, the inferior concha are taken as uh, two separate bones then you have the mandible here so these are the bones that form the facial skeleton uh, so we don't ask you to list these bones we never do that 
uh, I know when I mean, you do advanced level, you know, you, you have to know the bones by their count, you know, how many bones will form this and how many bones will form that. But uh, we don't do it that way. Okay, so you have an idea about the two types of bones. Uh, there are cranial bones and facial bones. Uh, and But these bones are rather than their numbers, exactly. Then, uh, this is a beautiful diagram um, from one of the textbooks you study. Uh, I will not uh, discuss the whole diagram, but I will concentrate on the outer layers of this. Now, you can see the skull here. Now, this is the, the, the skull bone. Now, uh, my focus is uh, the, the tissues, soft tissues outside the skull here, which you call scalp. So this is like the, the skin and the soft tissues uh, of the uh, head outside the uh, bone, the skull bone. So this is a fairly thick area. Now, if you compare with the, the thickness of the bone here, this is the thickness of the bone. And uh, this is the thickness of the uh, skin and the underlying soft tissues. It's almost like double according to this picture. So, uh, so when you hit the head against a, a hard surface, uh, because of the hard surface on one side and uh, the, uh, the hard skull on the other side, the skin and the soft tissues in this area can split. So that is what you um, see in, in a head injury. Uh, <clears throat> it's not the skull that uh, breaks, it's the soft tissues over the skull that breaks uh, when you say Oluopaluna or something like that. Uh, so remember this point. Uh, it is important to know about these uh, soft tissues that are outside the skull. Um, as a shortened form, you call them scalp. It's C-A-L-P. Uh, so in that direction, I have put uh, scalp. S means skin. S means skin. A skin and C is for connective tissues and A is for aponeurosis. L is for loose uh, connective tissues and P is for um, periosteum or the pericranium in this case. Uh, periosteum is a general term for all the bones. Uh, when it comes to the skull, you call it pericranium. So these uh, five layers will form uh, the area called uh, scalp. So when you say scalp, skin is also part of it. Uh, so uh, the scalp lacerations that I was talking about before, if you hit, hit the head against hard surface, you can get scalp lacerations, which you will have to suture. Otherwise, there will be a lot of bleeding. You call it profuse bleeding because there is a uh, good blood supply to the, um, the scalp with a lot of anastomosis between uh, many uh, arteries. Uh, so, if somebody say, asks you why there is profuse bleeding in uh, scalp lacerations, uh, one reason is there is uh, a very good blood supply, uh, very rich blood supply to the scalp with a uh, lot of anastomosis. You can name the anastomosis, you can name the, uh, the arteries later when you learn the details about uh, the names of the uh, arteries and all. For the moment, you can't say that. But there are other points that I need to uh, stress here. Uh, the, the purpose of this lecture is not going into details, but since there is no separate lecture for scalp, I will discuss this uh, because questions are asked from this area. Now you can see a lot of uh, blood vessels here. You see blood vessels here, one, one. So these are all uh, branches from different arteries that supply the scalp. I already said uh, between these arteries, there are a lot of anastomosis. Uh, now, this, this blood vessels, you can see, they lie in the connective tissue layer. So they lie in the connective tissue layer. And uh, there are a lot of fibrous bands, collagen fibers, in the connective tissue layer. They bind these arteries, uh, the wall of the arteries, all around. So these arteries are bound outside by the, uh, the fibrous uh, bands, or fibrous tissue. Uh, and... Uh, if the arteries are broken due to a scalp laceration, um, the, they, the, it's difficult for the arteries to constrict. Usually when, uh, when the blood vessel is cut like that, it constricts. It constricts and becomes smaller. So that's part of uh, the, the cessation of uh, stoppage of bleeding. You call it hemostasis. I think you have learned it in uh, hemo. 
hemostasis. So part of it is uh, forming a blood clot and, uh, and part of it is the constriction becoming blood vessel, the, the, the diameter of the cut edge of the blood vessel, uh, cut end of the blood vessel becoming smaller. So that is prevented by this um, uh, fibrous tissue uh, attachments. So, uh, so remember this point if somebody asks you uh, why uh, profuse bleeding. So it's uh, rich blood supply with uh, good anastomosis um, and then uh, prevention of constriction of the blood vessels due to because the blood vessels are in the connective tissue layer and there are fibrous bands uh, attached to the fibrous tissue attached around the blood vessels. Uh, so there's another point. Uh, you can see this aponeurotic layer, aponeurotic layer underneath the connective tissue layer. Now this aponeurotic layer is something like this. Now there are two muscles. Now uh, there is a muscle attached to the, um, uh, the frontal. Now you have the skull like this. Uh, your orbit is here. Now this is the frontal bone here. Now there is a muscle here which is called frontalis muscle. Uh, you can contract it uh, when, you, uh, when you frown. Uh, you contract this frontalis muscle. And your skull is like this. You have the occipital bone here. And there is another muscle here called occipitalis muscle. Now this, attaching these two muscles, there is a flat tendon like that. Um, so, so this tendon, flat tendon is the one that is called uh, aponeurosis here, okay? So that is actually uh, a flat tendon like uh, the aponeurosis of the abdomen. You have seen the aponeurosis of the abdominal muscles, which are again flat tendon. So here you have these two muscles on either side, this side and that side. And this aponeurosis connecting up aponeurosis connecting up the two muscles. Actually, you call these two muscles uh, occipital frontalis muscle as a single muscle. You can call them. So both uh, get the nerve supply from the facial nerve uh, from two different types of branches. Uh, that's the same main facial nerve that supplies uh, both uh, bellies of the muscles. Now then, the, the point here is you have the aponeurosis here this layer and underneath that you have this L, loose connective tissue layer. So the moment you have a layer like this and uh, attached on either side like this and you have a very loose uh, connective tissue layer, if there's bleeding under that layer, blood can easily spread underneath the aponeurosis. Now if you, if you hit uh, the head of a person, um, it might not uh, lacerate uh, like in the previous example I gave you, it might not lacerate but there can be contusion, thelma. Get up again. Uh, there can be contusions. Uh, so in a contusion, what happens is there is bleeding inside the uh, skin and the soft tissues. So if there is a, a blow to the head like that, and if there is a contusion uh, with bleeding underneath the aponeurosis, between the aponeurosis and the, uh, the, the periosteum, pericranium, bleeding in this area, in the loose areolar tissue area, underneath the aponeurosis, then this blood can, as I said before, go in either direction. Now what happens is if it goes in the, in the forward direction to your uh, frontal area, uh, the blood can actually seep through the muscle attachments and can get collected inside your um, uh, eye. So that is called black eye. So you see this blood around the eye uh, as, a, as a black uh, staining under the skin. Um, so uh, uh, a blow on the on the head uh, can actually uh, give rise to black eye. You don't have to hit the eye directly to uh, cause the black eye. You can just hit the forehead or even behind that. Uh, and if you sleep uh, with the in, in the in the prone position, uh, blood can seep down into the eyes due to the gravity. So remember this point also. Then the other point is sometimes you get this evulsion injuries of the scalp. Evulsion means the whole thing comes out. Now, uh, especially females who work with machines, uh, rotating machines, uh, if they have long uh, hair, if the hair gets entangled uh, in a, in a uh, rotating machine, the whole uh, scalp can come out uh, in this uh, loose areolar tissue area that is just underneath the aponeurosis because the, the, the rest of it can easily come out. Uh, in this layer, okay, uh, breaking the loose areolar tissue, the rest of it will come out with the aponeurosis underneath. So, so they you call it um, uh, 
big living injury, so um, evolution of the skin. So then, uh, so that's another point that you need to remember. Then uh, there is another point. Uh, now the periosteum or the or the pericranium, the last one, uh, which is this layer. So that is part of the, uh, the, the skull bone, uh, and that is firmly attached to this suture line. So there are firm attachments at these points. Now you know different suture lines in the skull. You have the sagittal suture, coronal suture, uh, lambdoid suture, and all these sutures. Uh, at the suture lines, uh, this uh, the per pericranium is firmly attached to the suture line. If you go back, uh, if there is bleeding uh, underneath the pericranium, therefore, since the pericranium is firmly attached to the suture line, uh, the blood clot will be limited to that area, not like uh, bleeding under the aponeurosis, uh, where the blood can spread from one end to the other end. In this case, blood will be limited to the uh, suture lines. So if you bleed uh, under the uh, under the temporal bone, bleeding will be limited there. If you bleed somewhere here, uh, parietal bone, then again it will be limited by these suture lines into that area. So this is commonly seen in uh, newborn babies because during uh, the, the ch delivery, if there is obstruction of delivery, you apply uh, vacuums. Sometimes you apply a uh, vacuum like this, uh, vacuum like this, and suck to pull the head out of the birth canal. So during that process, uh, the, the pericranium can get slightly separated out with the scalp. Uh, it might not totally come out, but you can get bleeding in that layer. So these are uh, limited to these uh, suture lines. Remember that point. So someone can ask you uh, to um, explain the anatomical basis of uh, this limitation. Okay, that is because the peri. Uh, cranium is uh, attached to the suture lines. Okay, simple. Uh, then, uh, okay, the rest of it. Now, I will not uh, detail the discuss the rest of the the things here uh, because you have uh, the meninges in this picture. You have the brain here and the blood vessels in in certain spaces that you see uh, inside the cranial cavity. All these things we will uh, wait and we will discuss. Later, you know, if you take because this diagram is a very nice diagram which has a lot of information, so I will limit uh, the discussion on this uh, at this point. But one just one more point before I move further you can see these veins in the scalp in the uh, connective tissue layer in that layer I'm referring to. You see these veins, superficial veins of the scalp. You can see this vein is connected up with the dural venous sinuses, so this is how you get the venous. Uh, arrangement inside the cranial cavity, they are in the form of dural venous sinuses. They are in the form of venous sinuses. And you can see the superficial vein in the scalp is connected up with the uh, venous sinus, in this case, the sagittal sinus, with the vein passing through the skull bone. And such veins are called emissary veins. Okay. So this, these veins can be a source of spread of infection from the scalp into the uh, cranial cavity. So you can get the infections spreading from the scalp area uh, into the uh, this dural venous sinuses which can uh, cause problems. So, so there are other connections uh, between uh, deep veins, venous sinuses and superficial veins uh, and spread of infections. There are clinical points. You will learn these things uh, uh, when you move, uh, move on uh, with your course. Okay. Few things about the since this is an introduction, I'll go through all aspects of uh, what you're going to learn during the next few weeks. When it comes to the cervical vertebrae, uh, now uh, altogether you know that there are 33 uh, vertebrae in the in the spine. Now there are seven cervical vertebrae, seven cervical vertebrae, um, and uh, this in the cervical region. Uh, there is a secondary curve. You can see the secondary curve here. It's curved like this. Uh, and by now you should have an idea about the primary and secondary curves. Now, uh, you, when the baby is inside the womb, uh, your, uh, the spine is like a C here. Then once the baby is born, uh, when the baby tries to lift the head around three months, uh, lifting of the head 
creates this first uh, secondary curve. So this is the primary curve. Okay. So this is a secondary curve, which is the cervical secondary curve. Then when the baby uh, tries to um, sit and stand, then you get the uh, get another secondary curve, which is the lumbar curve. But uh, the lower part remains as a primary curve. So you have a secondary curve here, secondary curve there, primary curve here, primary curve here. So then the, the, the secondary curves are the, the, sec the cervical curve and the lumbar curve. This is cervical, this is lumbar. And the primary curves are the thoracic and sacral. They remain as they are. So uh, with this, you remember that this is a primary, uh, the, this is a secondary curve that is in the cervical region. The reason is the um, lifting of the head by the baby. Then the, uh, uh, okay, so, okay, before we go into these other details, uh, another point that you need to remember is even though there are seven uh, cervical vertebrae, uh, there are seven cervical spinal segments. Cervical spinal segments. Okay, so there are seven, uh, sorry, not seven, eight. Okay, so seven cervical vertebrae, but eight cervical spinal segments. And there, therefore, there are eight cervical spinal nerves. You can see the cervical spinal nerves here. One, two, like that. Actually, the first one is here. Uh, second one, third one, like that. So since there are eight cervical spinal segments, you have eight cervical spinal nerves. Now, uh, the first cervical spinal nerve, this is important later when you do the, uh, the spinal segments uh, and how they come out. Uh, now, uh, the first spinal nerve comes out between the uh, skull and the first uh, cervical vertebra, the atlas. So the first one comes out between the skull and the first cervical vertebra. Uh, second one comes out between the first cervical vertebra and the second one, third one between the uh, second and third. So uh, ultimately what happens is, uh, except the first one, uh, second one onward, uh, up to the seventh, they, they come out between its own vertebra and uh, the vertebra lying above it. Uh, so C2 spinal nerve, uh, the cervical spinal nerve comes out just above C2 um, vertebra. That's like that. But when it comes to the eighth cervical spinal nerve, which is, uh, must be this one, eighth cervical spinal nerve, that has to come out between the seventh cervical vertebra and the first thoracic vertebra. Okay. Uh, then the first thoracic spinal nerve will come out between the first thoracic vertebra and uh, second thoracic vertebra. And then the, the pattern continues. So just to remember that point, uh, anyway, you know, someone will uh, get back to it and discuss it when we do the spinal cord and spinal nerves later because there you can get spinal cord injuries, spinal nerve injuries, then you should be able to have a rough idea about depending based on the uh, symptoms and the signs that you elicit uh, during uh, history taking and clinical examination, you should be able to uh, have a rough idea where the lesion is to give rise to that clinical picture. So having that in mind, I just said this thing. Then the vertebral vessels, um, there are vertebral vessels, both vertebral arteries and vertebral veins. They pass through a hole in the transverse process of cervical vertebrae. Now all other vertebrae in the body, thoracic, lumbar, or uh, other vertebrae, they don't have uh, a foramen in the transverse process. But in the cervical vertebrae, you have a foramen. All uh, seven cervical vertebrae have a foramen in their transverse process, which is called um, transverse foramen or foramen transverse area. Either way, you can call it. Uh, now, the vertebral vessels, vertebral um, artery and vertebral vein, passes through the uh, foramen transverse area of uh, the cervical vertebrae. Not through all of them. Not through all of them. Uh, arteries enter at one level. Uh, veins enter at a different level. So, as a homework, uh, find out um, through which um, foramen transverse area, belonging to which cervical vertebrae uh, they pass through. Okay, so they enter at two different levels. Remember that point to study. Then, uh, like uh, other vertebrae, cervical vertebrae also, you can 
you can divide them into two groups like uh, typical cervical vertebrae and atypical uh, cervical vertebrae. In a typical cervical vertebra, you have a bifid spine, bifid spinous process. So this is the bifid spinous uh, process. Then uh, you have a foramen transversarium, as I said. So this is common for all cervical vertebrae. There is a foramen transversarium, whether it's typical or atypical. Then uh, there are tubercles on the transverse process. There is an anterior tubercle, and uh, this is a posterior tubercle. So this is an anterior tubercle. They are on the transverse process. So, so these are the features of a typical uh, cervical vertebra. Now, uh, there are atypical cervical vertebrae. Now, when it comes to typical cervical vertebrae, it's from the third to the uh, sixth cervical vertebrae are the typical cervical vertebrae. Then the atypical cervical vertebrae, uh, the first one and the second one and the seventh one, uh, they are atypical cervical vertebrae. Now the first one, if you take the atlas, the first cervical vertebra, it has no vertebral body. So you can't see a vertebral body there. Instead, you have a, an anterior and a uh, posterior. Uh, so this is actually anterior and a posterior uh, arch. There is no body. Uh, on the anterior side, okay, uh, and uh, on the other hand, axis, the second cervical vertebra, has dense. Now this is uh, no other cervical vertebrae has got this feature. Now uh, sometimes some anatomists describe dense as the lost body of the atlas. Okay, lost body of the atlas uh, is described as the uh, dense. Uh, whatever it is, so you have this uh, dense on the axis, uh, which makes it uh, atypical. Then the seventh cervical vertebra, uh, the, the, the difference in the seventh cervical vertebra is that its spine is not bifid. It has got a spine, uh, and that is the, the usually it is the longest spine of all uh, seventh cervical vertebrae. Therefore, you call it uh, uh, vertebra prominent. Okay, it's prominent, non bifid spine. You call it this, uh, the seventh cervical vertebra, therefore, is called vertebra prominence. Uh, so, then because of this reason, that also becomes atypical. But if somebody asks what is uh, the, the, the feature that can uh, make you understand, if you ask for one feature, the feature that uh, differentiates a cervical vertebra from another vertebra in the body, thoracic or lumbar or sacrum then uh, that is the uh, none other than the uh, foramen transverse area okay so that is the feature that differentiates so whether it's typical or atypical you get the foramen transverse area then the boundaries of the, the head and neck uh, it's not really the head it's boundaries of the neck okay head will be anyway you know defined when you define the neck now uh, the actual neck is much longer than uh, you uh, the area you call neck uh, in your bodies now this is how you um, uh, define the, the boundaries if you define the lower boundary first in front uh, i don't know whether you see these videos in front uh, you have this uh, suprasternal notch suprasternal notch you can call it superior border of the manubrium if you want then from there uh, the line goes along the superior uh, border or the superior surface of the clavicle up to the acromion uh, that is above the above the uh, shoulder joint you know the acromion uh, then from the acromion uh, to the vertebra prominence spine of the seventh cervical vertebra you draw an imaginary line a dotted line from here to here okay um, then uh, then you continue from from that line uh, to the other side and you continue all the way up to the suprasternal notch so that is the lower boundary of the neck it is the lower boundary of the uh, neck then the upper boundary you start with the external occipital protuberance at the back here so you have studied the bones you know what is external occipital protuberance then uh, leading from the external occipital protuberance you get the superior nuchal line it's not a straight line it's a curved line and then go behind the ear and you get the mastoid process here behind the ear behind the lower part of the ear you get 
but is called mastoid process. So you go from the external occipital protuberance along the superior nuchal line back of the ear up to the mastoid process. Then from the mastoid process, you draw a dotted line uh, to the superior uh, border of the ramus of the mandible. You get the mandible here. Okay. Superior border of the ramus of the mandible. Then you go along the posterior or the, the posterior border. It's a posterior border. Okay. Posterior border of the ramus of the mandible and continue along the inferior border of the uh, mandible, body of the mandible. Uh, and uh, you go uh, along to the other side and connect up from the other side up to this uh, point. Uh, so you can divide the neck into left and right halves, especially when it comes to uh, defining the muscles and the triangles of the neck. So you can have an anterior mid sagittal line and a posterior mid sagittal line here, dividing the neck into a left and a right half for descriptive purposes. Now, usually when we, uh, when we discuss with each other as lay person, uh, you don't take this area as the neck usually. You take only something like this as neck. Okay. Um, so remember this point, the boundaries of the neck. Then when it comes to the inside of the neck, you draw the neck like this, a cross section of the neck. Then there are uh, four major compartments that form the neck. So which include all the visceral organs, blood vessels and muscles and the uh, spine, the bones in that in the neck. So there's a large component at the back, which is called the, uh, the uh, large compartment, which is called the vertebral compartment, which includes the, um, the, 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 the vertebrae here and the, uh, the muscles surrounding the vertebrae. You call them paravertebral uh, muscles. Vertebra and the vertebr vertebral column, uh, the cervical vertebral column and the paravertebral muscles, they form one compartment which is called the vertebral compartment then in front you have a visceral compartment which includes the visceral uh, organs like the trachea and the esophagus here uh, and the pharynx above the esophagus then laterally you have two compartments which are called uh, vascular compartments which include the, uh, the common carotid uh, and internal carotid vessels uh, all you know carotid vessels and the uh, the, the, the internal jugular uh, veins. So there's much more to the neck than this, but it's very easy when you describe it in compartments. We will uh, discuss about the neck again in a, in a separate lecture. We'll discuss about the facial structures, facial arrangements of the neck and um, the rest of it. So this is how you see the compartment. This is from, I think, students, uh, um, Grace Anatomy students version. You see the vertebral compartment here. You see the visceral compartment here containing the trachea and the esophagus and the thyroid gland in relationship to the trachea and the larynx. Uh, so larynx is also in this compartment. And then you get the two vascular compartments on either side. And this, all these compartments are surround, surrounded by several muscles uh, in the neck. We'll discuss all these things later. Then the triangles of the neck. Uh, now you have this sternocleidomastoid here on the anterolateral aspect of the neck uh, from the, the mastoid process to the, the, the superior surface of the medial end of the clavicle and the manubrium here. So this is called sternocleidomastoid therefore, sternocleidomastoid. Uh, and uh, sternocleidomastoid divides the neck and you have the trapezius muscle here, main uh, principal muscle of the neck here, um, where you get uh, pains related to uh, most of the time, the neck pains are related to the trapezius muscle sprain. Now, having these two muscles, trapezius and sternocleidomastoid, will divide the neck into two major triangles. So, this is called anterior triangle because it is anterior to the sternocleidomastoid. This is called posterior triangle because it is posterior to the sternocleidomastoid and anterior to the, uh, the trapezius uh, muscle. Uh, so remember this uh, point and if, if you go further, you can actually divide the anterior triangle uh, into two halves. You have the right anterior and left anterior triangle uh, with the mid uh, sagittal uh, line. So you, you can further divide the anterior triangle into uh, sub triangles. Now you haven't learned the muscles yet, therefore you might have difficulty in understanding. There's a muscle called digastric muscle 
having two bellies, anterior belly and posterior belly, uh, which forms a triangle between the lower border of the mandible and the two bellies of the muscle, which is called the digastric triangle. Then, uh, with the same muscle, the anterior belly of the same muscle, and the uh, mid sagittal line uh, and the hyoid bone here will form the submental uh, triangle. Then, uh, sternocleidomastoid here together with the posterior belly of digastric muscle I mentioned and uh, there is a muscle called omohyoid muscle, this is the superior belly of omohyoid. These three will form the uh, carotid uh, triangle which is important later I will tell you. Then there is another triangle in front, in front of the sternocleidomastoid and the superior belly of omohyoid and the uh, midline, anterior median line which is called the muscular triangle. All the muscles, anterior muscles in the neck, uh, in front of the thyroid gland, they lie in the, uh, the muscular triangle. It's a little early for you to you know, introduce this, but uh, we'll just you know, introduce it so that you, know, you will read around it. Then the posterior triangle uh, can be taken as one triangle or you can divide it into uh, an upper occipital triangle. This is the posterior triangle, occipital triangle above and the subclavian triangle below by the presence of this inferior belly of, this is the same muscle going like this, this superior belly and this is inferior belly of omohyoid will divide the posterior triangle into an occipital triangle and a subclavian triangle. Your subclavian vessels will be found in that triangle. So this is how you divide the neck into two main triangles and their sub-triangles. Then uh, these are the areas that you will uh, uh, dissect and, and learn. Uh, you will uh, you will have uh, let me have five minutes. Okay, two minutes. You study different areas. Now, one uh, such area is the uh, the temporal region. So this is the uh, temporal region. Sorry, this is the temporal region. You have the, the temporalis muscle here. You can see the temporalis muscle here. Then underneath this, this muscle, under cover of this muscle, you get the, uh, you get the uh, deep temporal vessels and uh, superficial to the muscle, you get the superficial temporal vessels. So we will study these uh, things and this uh, temporalis muscle, uh, even though it's here, its tendon passes down here. And uh, so this is your zygomatic uh, process that is cut and removed here. So this, this this tendon passes deep to the zygomatic process which has been removed here and gets attached to the coronoid process of the mandible um, and when you for you to close the mouth, uh, clench the teeth, uh, this is important to uh, contract and clench the teeth. So you study the temporal region during your dissections or during practicals if you don't have dissections. Then the infratemporal uh, fossa. Uh, now, if you have a skull with you right now, you can uh, take a look at it. Now, in this, uh, in this image, uh, what uh, it, they have done is they have cut the ramus of the mandible. So it's cut here and they have cut the, uh, the zygomatic process here to open up the uh, intratemporal region. So just knowing that the, the, the ramus of the mandible and the um, zygomatic process has been cut and then you see the intratemporal region there, intratemporal fossa there, um, is good enough because then you know where it is. Some, sometimes students come for vivas and they don't know where the intratemporal uh, fossa is. Now in an inferior view of the skull, you have the mandible here, you have the palate here, and uh, you have the, uh, okay, this is the whole thing is the mandible. Okay, you have the zygomatic process here. Now you can see uh, this area is the intratemporal fossa. Okay, so this whole area is the intratemporal fossa. There are important structures in the intratemporal fossa. That's why you learn it as a separate uh, region. Uh, you get all your, uh, uh, not all, you get some important muscles in that area which are called uh, medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. Now here you see this, uh, this is, these are the pterygoid plates of the 
uh, sphenoid bone. These are pterygoid plates. Uh, and this is the, uh, the posterior surface of the maxilla. And then you get the palate here. So you, you, you get the, the pharynx in this area. So this area is the area for the pharynx. Okay. So you see it here. This is the area for the pharynx. So this, this area is seen here. Okay. And you see this uh, pterygoid plates that I mentioned in front. So these are pterygoid plates. Okay. So this uh, medial and lateral pterygoid plates. So this, this will actually form the medial boundary of the infratemporal uh, region. Then the lateral boundary is formed by the ramus of the mandible. Anteriorly, you get the maxilla and parts of the hard palate there. Uh, then posteriorly, you get the styloid process and uh, things like that. Then the other, other important thing here is that uh, you can see here is when you do the cranial nerves, you will learn. Now, by now, you must have studied the, the, the skull. So you must have seen uh, the foramina in the uh, skull base. Now you see a foramen here opening into the infratemporal region. This foramen is called foramen ovale, through which one important cranial nerve enters the infratemporal region. And that cranial nerve is the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. And this mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve is the nerve that supplies all muscles that are involved in the process of mastication, chewing, chewing. So the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve enters the infratemporal region through the foramen ovale here. Remember that point. Other things you will learn when you uh, do the infratemporal region in your practicals. Then there's a very small area called pterygopalatine fossa. Now this area, we, we discussed this, this is infratemporal region. Uh, now, the leading from the infratemporal region, there's a small slit like area which is called pterygopalatine fossa. Pterygopalatine fossa, it's called pterygopalatine because behind you get the pterygoid uh, plates, the sphenoid bone. In front, you get the, the maxilla here and the palate, hard palate, bones of the hard palate in that area. Okay, uh, so it's called pterygopalatine fossa. Uh, not many things. Are uh, there? You don't have muscles and uh, but there is there is a ganglion there. There are some nerves passing through it. Pterygopalatine uh, fossa. But um, you can have uh, a look at it when you uh, you can actually take a look at the skull base if you have the one with you right now. Then the parotid region is another important region that you study when you study the endemic region. Uh, now the parotid region. You get the parotid gland there in the parotid region in front of the ear. Uh, then uh, you get the parotid duct passing forward then opening into the oral cavity. Uh, and most importantly, the, the facial nerve uh, has its terminal five branches here uh, at the parotid gland. So it divides into five branches. Facial nerve divides into five branches in the parotid gland. So, so that is also an important happening in the parotid uh, region. Then the suboccipital region, the back of the neck here, the back of the neck below the external occipital protuberance here uh, and the superior nuchal line, that area is called the suboccipital region. Uh, with the, the current situation with uh, not having much time for dissections, uh, highly likely that you will not dissect the suboccipital region because uh, there is nothing much that you need to learn and remember. But there are a few important points uh, which you can study, uh, which you can study through the prosected specimens. Uh, so I will not go into details of the suboccipital region in this lecture. Then these uh, muscles of facial expression. So all the muscles in the facial uh, area, uh, these muscles. On one side, these muscles are attached to the bone, and uh, on the other side, they are attached to the dermis of the skin. So you have the skin, you have the hair and epidermis, and then you have a dermis. So these muscles are attached to the dermis of the skin, and when the muscles contract, skin can be moved. So that actually allows you to express, do facial expressions. You can express things through your face because you can change the shape of the, uh, the, the skin.
skin and the underlying soft tissues by contraction of these muscles. You have a long list of muscles. We don't expect you to remember the names of all these muscles, but uh, you better know about the frontalis muscle, its nerve supply. And as I said before, uh, it has another half at the back, which is the occipitalis muscle, and the two are connected through the aponeurosis, uh, which I was discussing when I did the uh, scalp. Uh, then you have this uh, circular muscle surrounding the, uh, the uh, occupying the orbit, which is called orbicularis oculi. Orbicularis oculi, which has a orbital part and a palpable palpable part. Uh, so palpable part is important for the movement of the uh, eyelids. Um, um, the orbital part helps to close the eye forcefully. Then similarly, you have this uh, muscle surrounding the uh, mouth, which is called the orbicularis oris. Orbicularis uh, oris. So these uh, three muscles that I mentioned are much more important than other muscles. So if you Forget these three, you will have problems. Uh, possible you can have problems, but uh, you, you don't have to know the names of all the muscles, uh, facial muscles. Important thing is all these muscles of facial expression are supplied by one cranial nerve, which is the seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve. Muscles of facial expression are supplied by the facial nerve. That's why you call it facial nerve. Then the muscles of mastication, uh, so there are many muscles involved in the process of mastication, chewing, process of chewing. Now, temporalis is one muscle on the side of the, the head. Uh, and you have the masseter here, uh, underneath the parotid gland. And then inside, in the infratemporal region, as I said before, you have the lateral and medial pterygoid muscles in the infratemporal region. Then you have muscles here, the, the bilohyoid muscle, digastric muscles, so all these muscles are uh, categorized under the uh, group of muscles of mastication. And uh, now we said the facial muscles of facial expression are supplied by the facial nerve. Muscles of mastication are supplied by the uh, mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. It's not the whole trigeminal nerve. <coughs> trigeminal nerve is uh, the largest uh, cranial nerve. Uh, vagus is we can call the vagus is the, is the longest. Vagus is the longest cranial nerve. Uh, as thickness, when it comes to thickness, um, trigeminal is thicker than the vagus nerve, but this is the longest. Okay, we'll come back to it later. So it's not the whole trigeminal nerve, but the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve is the nerve of muscles of mastication, which comes out through the foramen ovale into the infratemporal region first, which is shown here actually. So you will discuss the details later, okay? Okay, so we, uh, it's almost one hour gone. Uh, okay, shall we take a two minute break? Then we will move on to the introduction of the nervous system. Two minutes break, okay? Okay, we will start again. Now the uh, the nervous system. Now this is how you can summarize the nervous system, the general arrangement of the nervous system. Uh, you have, uh, okay, I'll remove the US, US problem with the US. Okay, now you have the uh, sensory organs on one side, sensory organs and receptors uh, on one side. 
So when you say sensory organs, eye, ear, uh, the nasal mucosa, the olfactory mucosa, uh, the taste buds of the tongue and all that. So you have either sensory organs or if they are not at the level of organs, they, you can just have sensory receptors like um, uh, receptors for touch, pressure uh, in your uh, skin, especially in the fingers. Um, then uh, you have free nerve endings sometimes uh, as receptors for pain. So you get either organs, sensory organs or sensory receptors. Then their, uh, their function is now the sensory organs also inside them actually there are sensory receptors. So the receptors uh, will actually generate nerve impulses and the, the nerve impulses are taken through the sensory nerves uh, to the brain and the spinal cord. Now there are separate nerves that take these sensory inputs to the brain which are called cranial nerves and uh, there are separate nerves that take these impulses to the spinal cord which are called spinal nerves. So you have cranial nerves taking impulses to the brain and there are spinal nerves taking impulses, sensory impulses, inputs to the sensory inputs to the spinal cord. So that's the basic thing. So this is the input this is the input that you get to the brain. This is the input you get to the brain. And these sensory ones, since they go towards uh, the inner aspect, the uh, inner inside of the body, you call them afferent, going in. Going in, afferent nerves, sensory nerves, so afferent nerves. Then uh, there's a lot of processing going on in the brain and the spinal cord, especially in the brain. Spinal cord also, to some extent, there's processing. And after this processing, uh, motor outputs or the motor impulses are taken out through motor nerves or you call them efferent nerves coming in the opposite direction, going outwards. So motor nerves and efferent nerves will take nerve impulses to the effector organs. To the effector organs. Now the effector organs uh, are muscles and glands. So all the things that you do voluntarily or involuntarily uh, is done through either contraction of a muscle, voluntary or involuntary muscle, or secretion uh, of a gland, which is involuntary anyway. So you can't uh, voluntarily secrete from glands, you know that. Don't you? So then um, whatever you do, it's just contraction of muscles or secretion from glands, whether it's voluntary or involuntary. So this is the, the general arrangement of the, uh, the, the central nervous system. Uh, we will go into a little bit of uh, little bit of details of it. I think this uh, this is disturbing. No? Shall I stop the video so that you will see? So general uh, general functions of the nervous system. General functions of the nervous system. Now uh, contraction of uh, muscles. When it comes to contract, because I said it's either contraction of muscles or secretion from glands. Now it can be skeletal muscles. It can be skeletal muscles, which is uh, voluntary uh, and it actually moves joints, skeletal muscles. So they are attached to bones and they move joints. Uh, so the other type of muscle is the smooth muscles. It is involuntary, so it is supplied by either sympathetic or parasympathetic parts of the nervous system. Involuntary part of the nervous system will get back to uh, in a short while. And these smooth muscles, uh, which are involuntarily controlled are found in the gut, uh, blood vessels, and all other internal organs like uh, your respiratory tract, urinary tract, all these tracts will have smooth muscles uh, controlled involuntarily. And uh, even in the skin, you have some smooth muscles. Then you get the cardiac muscles, which is also involuntary, uh, under involuntary control by the autonomic nervous system uh, of the body. Then the secretion by glands, anyway, it's involuntary, as I said before. So you get salivary glands and um, glands uh, related to the digestive tract. All these things will secrete. Then other than these uh, uh, sensory inputs and motor outputs, uh, whether, whether there are motor out, outputs or not, there, there is a lot of integration taking place inside the uh, brain. Uh, so this integration, once it gets inputs uh, through different uh, organs, either through the eyes or you know some sound heard, uh, you get uh, through the ear, 
or you get some smell. Same things can you, know, you can smell them through the nose, or you get them through 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 touch here. You touch these things, whether it's soft or hard. All these inputs will uh, give you information, and the brain will process them, integrate them, and uh, the output would be uh, to decide first which one to be eaten. This or this, then uh, then you actually eat it. So you contract all your muscles around. Uh, you take it in. Then uh, muscle muscle contraction could be voluntary. Then you get your secretion of saliva for the process, which is involuntary through glands. And you swallow. Initially, it's voluntary. All the muscles here will contract. Uh, and then after the pharynx, it becomes involuntary. So it's peristaltic movements of the gut. So all this this that's how we live our life. Okay. Then uh, the brain has the capacity uh, to coordinate activities. So you, if you just contract muscles and try to move joints, um, it will not happen uh, properly unless you coordinate. If I ask you to, uh, if I uh, say, let me see, uh, if I ask you to touch the nose, uh, if, you, if you, if I ask you to take the hand from a from a distant place and touch your nose. Uh, you can't do that unless there is good, good coordination between all the muscles, your biceps, triceps, uh, and all the muscles of the interesting muscles of the hand, because you will not stop there. You will go beyond the nose or you will go to a side. So this coordination is so important to uh, touch the, uh, the tip of the nose or any other place for that matter. Um, so a lot of coordination is necessary. Actually, in patients, you can see these uh, problems with coordination, especially when there are uh, issues with the, uh, the parts of the brain, you see these issues with the coordination. Um, then the memory. So, so humans, even the animals, they have memory. Uh, so this memory is uh, important for the functioning of the uh, actual functioning of the brain. Then uh, reflexes, now sudden action without thinking uh, as an in immediate reaction to a situation is called reflexes. Uh, someone is getting a call outside. Okay, let me close the <laughs> windows and come back. Okay, um, now the reflexes are sudden action without thinking as an immediate reaction to situation. Now in this example, this person, um, sorry, this person uh, accidentally burns the finger and then the, immediately uh, the, the reflex contraction of uh, biceps uh, or triceps based on where it burns, uh, the hand is taken uh, out. There is a reflex, so which need not go into the brain. You have brain reflexes at that level. Uh, sometimes uh, you have spinal cord level reflexes. So uh, the brain reflexes will connect up the cranial nerves. Spinal cord reflexes will connect up with the spinal nerve. Then uh, this is how you divide the the, uh, the the nervous system into parts. You can have two types of uh, divisions. You can have a functional division, you can have a structural division. Now in all textbooks, you use both from time to time. You go for functional, you go stru for structural divisions. As long as you know what it really means, then there is no problem. Otherwise, um, you will get confused. 
now uh, functionally you can divide the nervous system into a sensory sensory half and a motor half now we know divide it like that whether it's the brain or the spinal cord or the peripheral nerves peripheral nervous system uh, you get this division you have a sensory side and a motor side so that's one way of dividing it into two sides or you can divide the nervous system into two parts as the voluntary part and the involuntary part we just mentioned so involuntary part of the nervous system is also called uh, autonomic nervous system which you know already has two components sympathetic and parasympathetic anuvegi saha pratyanuvegi in sinhala now again you know when you divide the, the nervous system into two groups like uh, two halves like voluntary and involuntary or voluntary and autonomic uh, then the brain spinal cord the, the nerves peripheral nerves uh, you can divide all of them into a voluntary and involuntary okay uh, then when it comes to structural uh, division one way to divide is uh, somatic and visceral um, you know somatic uh, refers to uh, all uh, all nervous parts related to the skin and the skeletal muscles so visceral means uh, related to the internal organs and blood vessels uh, so again uh, you can have somatic nerves you can have visceral nerves and somatic nerves connect up with the somatic parts of the parts of the brain that deal with the somatic uh, part of the nervous system and there are parts of the brain and the spinal cord dealing with the uh, the visceral organs then again you can divide the central nervous system rather you can divide the nervous system into a central part and a peripheral part central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system here the central means uh, the parts that are in the center like the brain and the spinal cord uh, or you can use the term central uh, to to mean that it is the main part now the central bus stop or the central post office is not always in the center of the city okay but it's called central because it's the main uh, post office so main uh, bus stop so like that you know central can have two meanings the brain and the spinal cord they are in the center and at the same time they are the main uh, controlling part of the nervous system then the peripheral nervous system uh, is the part that goes out so all your cranial nerves coming out from the brain and the spinal nerves coming out from the spinal cord uh, whether they are voluntary or involuntary whether they are sensory or motor okay so that's why i said you can have all these classifications together or whether they are somatic or visceral um, you you call them if they are in the center you call them central if they are in the periphery like this they are in the periphery you call them peripheral nervous system so this is the central nervous system and this is the peripheral uh, nervous system all these receptors and the afferent nerves efferent nerves and the effector organs um, uh, is peripheral nervous system is this part actually okay Uh, so these are organs are separate okay um, so then uh, in, in anatomy when we learn anatomy uh, the main classification we use uh, the key classification that we use is this you divide it into this central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system not forgetting the other ways of classifying it because you can actually put them uh, in here so the central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord peripheral nervous system includes the cranial nerves and spinal nerves now if you take one cranial nerve if this is a cranial nerve you can have somatic nerve fibers in this one you can have autonomic nerve fibers in this one okay uh, and you can have um, voluntary and involuntary it's very similar to the previous uh, classification motor and sensory um, so this it's like that you will learn it you know when you uh, continue Module. So, when you take the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, brain is inside the cranial cavity here, and the spinal cord uh, starts from the foramen magnum here in the skull base uh, and continues down uh, through the um, vertebral canal of the spinal cord. Vertebral canal of the spinal cord, uh, usually up to the lower border of L um, one. up to the lower border of uh, l1 uh, vertebra
and the central nervous system contains cell bodies and nerve fibers i will come back to it so this is the foramen magnum you have learned it okay so below that is the spinal cord now the peripheral nervous system these are the cranial nerves and spinal nerves as i said before peripheral nervous system includes cranial and spinal nerves with the cell bodies uh, and uh, cell bodies means the ganglia lying outside now all these nerves uh, now this now if you look at the spinal nerve this swollen area is called the dorsal root ganglion now this is a collection of sensory cell bodies which lies outside the spinal cord so that is called uh, uh, ganglion that's why we call it dorsal root ganglion which is on the dorsal side similarly you have ganglia related to the cranial nerves now spinal nerves will have dorsal root ganglia outside the central nervous system cranial nerves will have cranial nerve ganglia outside the brain now they can be inside the cranial cavity but outside the brain now you have one famous ganglion here which is called the trigeminal ganglion which which includes the sensory cell bodies of the trigeminal nerve trigeminal nerve has several branches okay uh, ophthalmic maxillary and mandibular divisions so all these when they bring sensory nerves their cell bodies would be in the uh, trigeminal ganglia so the vagus nerve facial nerve uh, all these sensory nerves will have um, uh, cranial nerve ganglia their ganglia containing sensory cell bodies outside the central nervous system so they are part of the peripheral nervous system then uh, uh, as part of the peripheral nervous system you get uh, the sympathetic chains on either side of the vertebral column you get the sympathetic uh, chains here and uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves they can be either separate or the, uh, the their fibers can be uh, inside the uh, spinal and cranial nerves uh, so when they are separate uh, usually you call them splanchnic nerves you can have um, different types of splanchnic nerves when you do the abdominal dissection you do the pelvic uh, dissections you find uh, splanchnic nerves uh, so they are separate uh, autonomic nerves but otherwise they are inside the same uh, cranial uh, or spinal nerve now uh, when you look at a nerve cell this is how you see a nerve cell a neuron uh, you have a cell body here uh, and you have uh, the fibers fibers are either short fibers called dendrites or uh, long fibers called axons uh, so all your peripheral nerves um, especially the nerves that you have seen uh, cranial nerves you have not seen yet you have seen median nerve ulnar nerves radial nerve musculocutaneous nerve all these nerves they are formed of axons whether they are sensory nerves or motor nerves they are formed of axons remember that point so these long nerve fibers are called uh, axon the details of the uh, nerve cell uh, nerve fibers uh, you will learn uh, through a separate lecture structure of the uh, nerve uh, okay so this uh, nerve fibers uh, the axons are covered with what is called myelin sheath okay so it's a myelin sheath that covers it this is important for the rapid conduction so nerve fibers are here okay it's the it's one nerve fiber okay so it's myelin sheath surrounding one nerve fiber uh, okay cranial and spinal nerves contain axons of neurons this is by right mentioned then the distribution of nerve cells and fibers in the uh, the central nervous system now uh, now in the brain you get the uh, the 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 cell collection of cells is called gray matter and collection of fibers is called white matter in the central nervous system now in the brain the gray matter is outside the brain in the cortex of the uh, the brain which is uh, uh, this area and in the spinal cord gray matter is inside white matter is outside here the white matter is inside so that uh, is uh, some point that you need to remember uh, then in the peripheral nervous system as i said before cells are found in the peripheral nervous system cells are found in ganglia collection of cell bodies outside the central nervous system 
and the fibers are found in the nerves, like the median nerve and ulnar nerve. And all sensory nerves, whether they are somatic nerves or autonomic nerves, I'll remove the video. Let me remove the video. Uh, all somatic nerves, whether they are all, all sensory nerves, whether they are somatic or autonomic, have their cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion. When it comes to the spinal nerves, it's the dorsal root ganglion. And when it comes to the cranial nerves, it's cranial nerve ganglion. And there are no ganglia associated with motor nerve fibers. Okay. So it's only with the sensory nerves. So someone is disturbing. Let me check. So I will mute all again. Don't unmute yourself unless you want to raise something. Um, okay. Then uh, autonomic motor nerves have their cell bodies in the sympathetic chain. Autonomic motor nerves have their cell bodies in the sympathetic chain, if it is sympathetic, or near the visceral organs. Uh, they supply when it comes to the parasympathetic Nerves. I'll, I'll try to explain it. Uh, it's something like this. Okay, let me. It's grand. Where are we now? Shall we include one here? Okay, I will include the slide here so that I can write on there. Insert. Yeah, blank slide. Okay, now uh, if this is spinal cord, this is spinal cord. Uh, now the autonomic nerve, say the sympathetic nerve, will have fibers coming from the brain. Okay, so these are called. Uh, you will learn it later. Okay, so then these fibers with synapse with the uh, cell body here in the spinal cord, and the nerve fiber will come out, and this nerve fiber will synapse with the another cell here and that will have a fiber going out so this since this is a collection of cell bodies outside the central nervous system this is the central nervous system this is called a ganglion as i said gang this is a ganglion now since this is ganglion this nerve fiber is called Pre-ganglionic fiber. Pre-ganglionic fiber. This is therefore post-ganglionic fiber. Ganglionic. Post-ganglionic fiber. Now both sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, nervous system has this arrangement. There's a pre-ganglionic fiber and the post ganglionic fiber. Uh, so that is uh, the first thing that you need to remember. And the cell bodies of the pre ganglionic fiber lie inside the um, central nervous system. So if it is the, if it is the spinal nerves, it's the spinal cord. If it is a cranial nerve, it is the, uh, the brain. Pre ganglionic fiber will lie there. Then the, the post ganglionic fiber, cell bodies of the post ganglionic fiber will lie inside the uh, ganglion. And when it comes to the, uh, let me. When it comes to the, the sympathetic nerves, this ganglia, sympathetic ganglia lying outside the central nervous system, they, uh, they should be like this. They should be like this actually. A set of ganglia like this, uh, one after the other. But the issue is, when it comes to this preganglionic and postganglionic fibers, the postganglionic fiber uh, or the preganglionic fiber will move up sometimes and go out with the other fiber. Go move down and go out. Can move several segments up. So this actually forms this connection between the ganglia and the sympathetic chain in the end. Because they don't come out at the same level. They go up and come out. Go up and come out. Or go down and come out. So this will form the sympathetic chain. Uh, and the sympathetic chain, as you know, it's uh, just now if this is the spinal cord here, and if this is the, vert uh, the, the vertebral bodies are here, so it's just just outside the uh, vertebral column, vertebral canal, and it's very close to the uh, the central nervous system. Therefore, so the sympathetic system has shorter 
preganglionic fibers and if the organ is far away uh, uh, very long postganglionic fibers so preganglionic fibers are short and postganglionic fibers are long in the sympathetic nervous system on the other hand uh, in the parasympathetic nervous system uh, since they they don't have a sympathetic chain like that arrangement parasympathetic nervous system uh, the preganglionic fiber will be very long and if say it supplies the some some sensory organ here uh, say if it supplies the the gut tube here smooth muscles to the the ganglion is usually the preganglionic fiber will continue all the way to the gut wall and there you will have the, uh, the collection of the cell bodies of the postganglionic fiber and the postganglionic fiber will be very short here so when uh, you study the gut you have seen mesners and myentary plexus and these are actually uh, these uh, the, the cell bodies are also they are in the same uh, area of the gut tube when they form this nerve plexus so remember this point uh, then one of these fibers is uh, myelinated the other one is not myelinated so you call them uh, call them myelinated and non myelinated fibers and all stuff so the autonomic nervous system as we have already mentioned has these two components sympathetic uh, anuvegi and parasympathetic pratyanuvegi uh, so sympathetic nervous system has a thoracolumbar outflow you must have learned this when you did the a levels thoracolumbar outflow means uh, the, the sympathetic nerves uh, actually come out from the thoracic spinal uh, segments and lumbar spinal segments that's the middle area of the uh, spinal cord uh, uh, and then it forms the sympathetic chain as i said uh, just a moment ago then uh, the parasympathetic nerves uh, has got a craniosacral outflow so they don't come out from the center here it's for the sympathetic nerves so craniosacral means some parasympathetic nerves come out from the uh, the brain stem from the par lower part of the brain and some few come out from the sacral region so you call it craniosacral outflow so this part is for the sympathetic nerves uh, so this is one reason why the vagus nerve has to come down all the way uh, through the neck through the thorax into the abdominal cavity to supply the uh, the gut here because there is no other way to get parasympathetic to the uh, organs in the abdominal cavity you bring the vagus nerve which is the longest uh, cranial nerve Uh, so that you know uh, sympathetic can match the balance opposite action parasympathetic is brought through the vagus nerve then on the other hand since it is a thoracolumbar outflow for sympathetic uh, for when it comes to organs like the eye uh, and uh, like the salivary glands or whatever uh, in the head and neck region uh, for them to get sympathetic uh, since there is no sympathetic outflow in the brain you have to bring these nerves up into the head region through blood vessels and then supply these organs when it comes to uh, pelvic organs like the bladder uterus vagina uh, you get since you get the parasympathetic outflow here from the sacral region uh, you get uh, sympathetic outflow also from the lumbar region you can uh, supply them uh, through the uh, nerve plexus like uh, superior and inferior hypogastric plexus you will learn that later Uh, I have already mentioned the superior and inferior hypogastric plexus. I did when I did the pelvic region. I think okay, superior and inferior hypogastric plexus. They will supply the pelvic organs and perineal organs with autonomic nerves. This fight or flight reaction uh, is uh, something that you can make use of. You can use the fight or flight reaction to remember the action of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems on the body. Now, when you face some challenging situation, either you fight that situation, or you run away from that situation. Okay, you either fight or you run away from that situation. You call it fight or flight reaction. Uh, for both, you need to have increased activity of muscles. You have to contract the muscles either to fight or hit or run. You have to increase breathing. the rate of respiration has to go up the heart rate has to go up and you have to reduce the blood supply to the skin 
so you will get pale get reduced blood supply to the skin you increase the blood supply to the muscles you reduce the blood supply to your gut also you reduce the gut motility and your sexual functions will be all uh, inhibited so this is actually the action of the sympathetic nervous system this is the action of the sympathetic nervous system so sympathetic system is for fight or flight reaction then uh, once you fight you finish the fight then uh, either it's uh, rest and digest uh, or you feed and breed okay you can call it either so then for this you get the uh, activity of the parasympathetic uh, system so if you know this you can actually list out the without by hearting you can list out the uh, actions of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems so the sympathetic for the flight or fight or flight reaction increase the blood supply to the muscles reduce the blood supply to the gut and the skin and other internal organs inhibit the yeah, the, the peristalsis of the gut and contract the detrusor uh, contraction of the detrusor um, muscles uh, it's it's the relaxation okay this should be corrected as it's not contraction if you contract the detrusor muscle you will urinate okay so sympathetic has to relax the uh, con uh, the detrusor muscles of the bladder okay and it contracts smooth muscles so smooth muscles sphincters and close up the uh, the your urinary uh, tract and the uh, gut and inhibit secretions from glands the parasympathetic does the opposite of that increase the blood supply to the gut uh, and increase the gut motility and uh, open up its sphincters uh, and it contracts the detrusor muscle so that the bladder can get emptied emptied through the relaxed sphincters so so then you know if you know this you can easily work it out uh, uh, now this is uh, all I have to 